Wayfarers of the South Tigris is a game of symbols, lots of symbols. But in spite of what may at first appear to be some vast pictographic nightmare, the wilder thing is that it all starts to make some sense. There are two boards you'll interact with, a central map noting player progress with achievement bonuses and gatekeeping requirements as you pass adjacent section to section, left to right, until someone reaches the end and triggers the end of the game. The other is your player board. Don't be thrown off by the wonky protrusions. The board is actually set up to mirror the placement of cards in your tableau. Your main interaction with the game is placing one dice per turn on worker placement spots on your board, netting you resources or caravan tiles that upgrade the faces of your dice so that they can access more potent actions or give you more resources or allow any sorts of dice manipulation. And most importantly, dice actions can get you more cards. Land and water cards add new worker placement spots or triggerable effects. Sky cards with astronomical point scoring. Get it? Astronomical? It's stars? It, you get it. Inspiration cards to conditionally double said astronomical sky cards if fulfilled by the end of the game, and villager cards that augment your worker placement and triggerable effects. As players add dice to their board, eventually they'll rest, recovering their spent dice, and if they timed it right by having one or few or dice in their supply when they rest, they get a movement forward on the central track. But dice worker placement isn't enough for wayfarers, so non-player specific meeples are a complete separate system that can be used instead of taking an action with dice on your turn to place on locations surrounding the board which then incentivize the corresponding cards which net you placed meeples if obtained. Most points by way of cards, upgrade caravan tiles, and influence in the three guilds, which you better believe each have their own power if you spend influence from them on your turn, from dice manipulation to additional journeying along the map board, wins the game. Okay, so I'll admit, when I first sat down with Wayfarers, it was a bit disorienting. This is the fourth or fifth Garp Hill game that I've reviewed on this channel, and I'm no stranger to the iconography that they utilize and reutilize over and over again in all of their games. And that does give you a little bit of familiarity, but this was just like <laughs> everything that you've come to expect out of these games just cranked up to 11. And nonetheless, when it all started clicking together, it started feeling really good. So let's talk about like the highlights of this game. So first off, I absolutely love the sense of progression that you have and not just the forward momentum as you make your way along the map board, but also the development of your capabilities. I think fans of Paladins of the West Kingdom are going to be able to latch on to a lot here. There's that feeling that as you pivot one action into the next action, not only are you growing closer to the conclusion of the game, but you're getting exponentially stronger because placing a dice is suddenly going to be that much more powerful, or you're going to have access to much better actions. And as you accrue all of these different cards with various symbols that are like the keys to passing into each of the next stages of the map, you feel like you have more options. And speaking of the map, as you go along, you unlock more too. You have dice that are going to come to you. You unlock the special caravan tiles that are unique one-offs that give you a bunch of points, but also count as one of the tags that will further help you fulfill any of your goals. And that forward momentum is a big part of the delicate balance that is this game. And one of the other things that really just fascinated me, which is that there's this, this, this equilibrium that you have to meet between maximizing your efficiency and making sure that you're always pushing forward. I mean, take the journal action, for instance, which your only reliable way of always triggering that is to take a rest whenever you have zero or one dice, which is great. You can reliably just use up your dice, then you journey and you move forward. But there are a lot of things that you can do with your dice to manipulate them and recover already spent dice, including one of the built-in numbers in your caravan. So you can spend dice and then recover that dice 
and then spend dice again and maybe use some of your workers on some other actions, postponing that need to rest and recover everything, which it feels like you really want to wring every possible thing that you can out of your dice. That's just smart Euro gaming, right? But nonetheless, if you don't push forward, you won't have access to more dice and you're going to find yourself falling behind as other players are triggering the end of the game and capitalizing on some of the big point scoring conditions at the end. So there's always this sense of urgency that in spite of wanting to do more with your dice, with your workers, with your actions, that you're needing to propel yourself forward. And that equilibrium is immediately apparent and feels really good. Also, in spite of what seems like a wild soup kitchen of a game, once you kind of get a knack for it, there's a kind of an unbelievably great relationship between all of the systems of the game that just flows so fluidly between all the different cards, the workers that are spent on the locations around the board that go onto the cards that can be recovered by players accessing the green workers who are pretty much wild, but they're accessed by pushing yourself further, faster down the track. And then all of the dice actions that you have and the caravan tiles, it seems like a lot of disparate parts, but the unison of it flows so wonderfully together that it never feels like you have an abundance of too much, but you also always feel like if you really need to pivot into something, you have access, even if it's not the most efficient access, to that resource or card type or tag that's going to get you into the next bracket on the map. And cohesiveness is something that I always look for and respect in a game, especially one as big and large and in charge in its presentation and scattering of symbols as this. But that isn't to say that I loved everything about this game. I mean, clearly I have harped on the fact that it is a dizzying array of symbols and that does it no favors. Not only do I think that it can be really aesthetically off-putting as like a, a first initial blush that may turn off people who are looking at it at the table, but it's also a little bit disorienting to try to plan ahead with familiarity and playing this again and again, then I think you are going to adapt to some of the language of the game. And I'm not saying that I have an alternative to maintain the strategic purity of this game, but present it in an alternative form, but... I do think that the barrier to entry is pretty high for what is ultimately not that complex of a game, just a more complicated presentation than this way to game typically would have. And this issue is a bit compounded by the fact that if you find yourself in a situation where you've journeyed along the brackets and gotten into a position where you didn't really prepare for either of the potential options to skirt to the next page, well, that can be really disheartening because you're going to have to spend the next several turns and possibly a rest phase not journeying any farther to recover, to make sure that you have all the things that are going to allow you to progress. Ultimately, making it to the finale is not the end-all be-all of winning this game. You can still get a but ton of points through a ton of different means, but feeling like you're locked in stasis because you didn't really account for just the myriad of things that you would be up against gatekeeping you from location to location to location. You know, you didn't have enough observatories or enough river bends or open ocean tags or book tags or, or any of the seeming millions of different tags that you might need to progress along all the different potential paths that you can take. It just, it can be disheartening. But overall, Wayfarers of the South Tigris has been another hit by Phillips and McDonald for my group. Something that initially felt like, is this really going to replace some of our favorite games in this series? Is this going to be, you know, something that can actually contend with, say, Paladins of the West Kingdom or my personal favorite of the publisher's games, Raiders of Scythia? And it has proven to be another parallel rung that we can hang with. It does some interesting tableau building things that the publisher hasn't done in the past, but it has some familiarity, especially in the snowballing engine building aspect of it especially in the iconography aspect of it, it does feel like it has this substantial burden that you have to contend with, but the resulting strategic implications, the fun of the game, and the cohesiveness is 
incredibly worth it. So if you're able to put up with the visual smorgasbord that is the play space when you set up this game, and if you're someone who wants to put in the effort, is willing to take a couple L's on behalf of really learning the nuances of a game, getting better at it, learning patterns, and getting experience, and kind of wringing the most that you possibly can out of a specific game, then I think this is a game well worth investing in. And that is our review of Wayfarers of the South Tigris. But I want to hear from you. What are your favorite games from this publisher? And what are some of the games that you found initially the most inscrutable, but ultimately the most rewarding? Put it in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting. Thanks for being an awesome community. You know that I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald.